love light sound. I am Lorana Phipps Ray. Welcome to Tales from the Stage. Lorana Phipps Ray, accomplished jazz vocalist and member of the renowned Phipps family, Newark's first family of jazz, and wife of the legendary trumpeter Michael Ray of Cool in the Gang and Sun Ra Orchestra, assembles a cabaret of musical legends together to reflect on their personal lives and their musical journey in a 60-minute virtual talk show. Welcome to the show, everybody. Tales from the stage. Today's episode is entitled The Trumpets. It's a fireside trumpet chat. And on today, we're going to bring in Mr. Michael Ray from Cool. Hey, Mr. Ray. Mr. Bill Sutter from Atlantic Star. Hello, y'all. What's up? Carl here from Fish. Hey everybody, how you doing? Skip Martin from the Daz Band. How you doing? from Urban Guerrilla Orchestra. Lorana, I'm doing well. <laughs> Robbie Best from Stevie Van Zandt. How we doing? Pulliam from Dee Dee Bridgewater. What's up? And there you'll have the seven trumpets. Let's meet and greet. Hi, how is everybody doing? Well, well. Okay. All right. Very Anything good. Anything flat brothers get together, it's all right. <laughs> you know that. When is the last time uh, you've seen each other, guys? Well, I mean, these cats are in the industry, so. I see Bobby, in fact, he, he went over to France because I couldn't make it. And we've traveled the world. And of course, uh, with Carl, he played in Ardmore with Jazz and Fish. And I haven't seen Bill in a long time. We used to tour a lot. Double Bills and and then the infamous on twirling at the horns. <laughs> oh. They had a lot of stuff going. You know, I know I try to stay in touch as much as possible with the coronavirus thing. It's like doing roll call, make okay. sure it's above the ground. You know. right. What about you, Bill? 
Well, uh, it's been quite a while, at least uh, 30 some years since um, since I met up with the fellas because we, we split up over some nefarious uh, means with the manager and the accountant. But, uh, you know, uh, some guys went to, to Europe, like uh, uh, Shanghai, and, uh, Japan, China. And uh, some guys stayed here in, in the States. I stayed in the States. Made the biggest mistake of my life, got married. <laughs> <laughs> got dedicated and all that, tried to live that life when I should have been on the road, you know. But uh, now I'm back just playing my horn, man, cooling out, loving yeah. life the way it is. Lost the tooth, so that that hurt me. I couldn't play Happy Birthday, so it became a challenge to get my horn back together. And yeah. uh, it's been about two years, but, you know, you work up the muscle and you, you can play just as well as you did before, almost. Maybe a little more time. Well, thank you for that. Well, it's funny that you say that because I've had, uh, embouchure problems for some time because I got a cut lip in uh, Monte Carlo and we had to keep playing because we were on tour. So in order for a cut lip to heal, you got to stop playing. You got that right. Then cut. I got to Paris and played with a DJ and it's like 102 DBs with no mic. That was, that was a wrap. <laughs> so it just comes back around now, you know. But you know what? The worst thing that ever happened to me was this book called Our Band. You guys remember that book, <laughs> Our Band? This is That's old, old this, is, this copyright's in 1930. And they're telling you to tongue the note by pressing your tongue to the root, to the top teeth, and then pulling it back so that right. the parts come out. Man, that'll mess you up for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> A guy called Ray Brown. You guys remember a guy called Ray Brown? He played. Yeah. With, I played Scrubs. with Ray with Whitney Houston a couple of times. Great, Ray. I, he was playing so well. We were backstage. I said, "No, this guy's got to have a doubler. He's dead in tune. What's going on?" So the manager said, "No doubler." So I saw him in the mezzanine, and I, I mean, I just congrats. I poured the compliment on. The, I said, "It was unbelievable what you were doing with the horn." And the sax player was there too. I said, "Well, you were pretty good," but I went right back to the. The hardest uh, instrument to make a sound out of, and and, and he said, "Man, you're so upfront. I'm gonna show you how how he did it." He introduced me to tongue level, man. <laughs> hey, Henry, what's going on, darling? Lorana, I'm doing well, and I just want to say, what's happening, Mike, Bill, Kurt, Carl, Skip, Robbie, and Brother Pulliam. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen heard a mic since that last Cool in the Gang gig, boy. It was killing. <laughs> cool. Cool. Uh, I had the great opportunity to play with Michael a bunch of times with Fish, but um, last time I saw him, like you said, was at the Ardmore in Pennsylvania. I think it was <laughs> 2016. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you for joining us. Kurt Pulliam, are you there? Uh, several of the gentlemen, I've known them, you know, like, for instance, Ravi, heard a lot about him. I feel like I know him. Uh, he came to the gang mm -hmm. after I did, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, I've heard he's such a phenomenal player. Um, mm -hmm. Michael, as you know, you know, me and him have been knowing each other since I was a kid, you know, about 15. The last time I actually saw him was during the holidays when I was in Trent, you know, we had a jam session and, you know, hung out and jammed and what have you. I also saw Henry during that same time. I went over to Philly to the, uh, what is it, uh, Warm Daddies, and I actually hung out and sat in with the UGO. We had a great time. And um, right now, you know, I'm here in Memphis. Uh, the virus is, uh, we're in phase three now, so I actually have a gig tonight and last night. You know, I'm playing in the house band uh, at B.B. King's Club down here. So, uh, you know, trying to keep my chops up, you know, haven't been on for almost three months, you know, and we all know that this trumpet is very unforgiving 
if you neglect her, you know, so I'm just trying to hang, that's all. I understand. Well, thank you for being here, darling, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Skip Martin. Hey, Skip, how are you? My gosh, it's been a while. Um, it's been a while since I've seen the guys, and, and uh, we have the coronavirus with all those things that were going on. Um, but even before that, um, I've been out of the gang for about uh, almost 18 years now. So I haven't seen them as much, but when they would come here to Vegas, I would see Michael and uh, go in and sit in with the band when I was home and they were home. So that's been, uh, it's been about 10 years or so. Wow, what have you been doing? Oh my goodness, I've been blessed. I've been, I've been writing songs. I wrote a children's book that I turned into a musical. My children's book is called Morgan the Clydesdale Pony. And uh, I've been having a fun time doing that. It's for kids from the ages of zero to eight years of age. Give some time to spend with their parents and their grandparents. And it's a story about esteem. So, um, you know, and I was one of those problem children that I uh, end up showing other parents and other teachers that the problem child really wasn't a problem child. He was just a child you needed to identify his needs. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was that example. So um, I needed certain things. I needed more time. I needed more things to challenge my mind and my brain. And um, thank God that he found me. And uh, I was able to use my gifts as a career. And now I'm 50 years into it. That's incredible. That's so incredible. Thank you, Skip. Um, you know, but, and like everybody else, I mean, I, unfortunately, I haven't seen Mike since uh, I left the gang to go out with Stevie. So, of course, I miss seeing um, seeing him, of course, and spending time with my B-flat yeah. brother out on the road. Um, but, uh, and Carl, I have to say, my wife is a major fish head, man. Major, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I have to hear about Trey Anastasio so much, <laughs> you know, throughout, the, throughout this whole virus thing, she keeps herself cool by watching all the concerts and things online, you know, she's, and she's dragged me to a few shows, actually, but, uh, so, you know, like everybody else, I mean, before this hit, I was out doing some touring with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, because I've been in that band for the past 20 years or so, oh, wow. and then I started a new Broadway show uh in town all about um lady diana this show diana was written by this guy david bryan who's the keyboard player for bon jovi so it's like a rock uh rock slash classical thing it's like jesus christ superstar and tommy um mm. you know with some classical stuff so i get to play some piccolo trumpet in that as well as pop out some screaming high notes which is you know fun so it's been a fun show but unfortunately we got into like the second week of previews and everything hit and everything came to a certain halt. So I've done some um, remote recording for the show uh, for some stuff that they wanted to put out on TV. So I've been able to do that. But like everybody else, I'm just waiting for, I mean, who knows when Broadway is going to be back up. We're just waiting to see what science can do so we can all get back to doing what it is we really love to do. Well, I am so glad to have all of you back, to see all of you well, healthy, and hoping to uh, move forward with some new, new, some new music. Why don't we take a break here, have a word from our sponsor, The Big Easy of Trenton. Once we come out of that, why don't we take a look at one of Michael Ray's videos with Charles Ellaby, and maybe Michael, when we come back out of that, you can tell, tell, tell us about it. Uh, all right. Thanks. Good evening. Coming from the Big Easy Restaurant, 120 South Warren Street. First and foremost, we'd like to give praise to the Most High for providing us with this opportunity once again to serve our brothers and sisters throughout this city, throughout the tri state area. Thank you. 
That was great. Thank you. That was Michael Ray with Charles Ellaby, and that song was entitled Just Like That. Check it out again on, on YouTube. So, gentlemen, this, this, this show is called Fireside Chat with the Trumpets. And I, I've read in many scriptures that the trumpets lead. Why is the trumpet so important, and why is it so sacred? Well, the trumpet, uh, it's written, who will answer the call if the trumpet is weak? You know, so uh, it was a, a herald instrument, a call to battle, call to arms, and even the African horns, the wooden trumpet, you know, it's, it's like acknowledgement. So, yeah, you in the house. Plus the val the volume of the trumpet, and right? Many, yeah, man, carries for miles. So you can signal the army, tell them to stop. You know all the bugle calls and reveille or whatever. You could tell them to charge. Not anymore. <laughs> but I mean, back in the day, I'm going way back now. <laughs> for real. <laughs> you, you remember, there were a lot of calls for everything. So, you know, that's the only thing you can hear over the battlefield back in the day. So yeah, great instrument. The thing about living in New Orleans, it's that's a city for trumpets. You know, it's like this you hand a little kid a trumpet, the first thing you want to do is start marching. And just want to spin the horn. They said, no, oh, that's a six thousand dollar horn. I said, let me try it. <laughs> <laughs> as far as uh shops and stuff, you know, like I have to really commend Robbie because he's got some very strong chops. You know, I always say, well, he's a no-nonsense trumpet player, and I'm a some-nonsense trumpet player. The match that we see. <laughs> and what do you say about that, Robbie? Oh, look, Mike is is being very humble in this moment, as we all know, because Mike Ray has some ridiculous chops. Anybody who has ever shared the bandstand with him knows that to be the utmost truth. So, um, I mean, he is definitely no nonsense as well. So, you know, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about being in groups where you have more than one trumpet player, you know, usually playing in bands, if you're, if you're in a quintet, you know, you're by yourself, you're only one. But the great thing about the larger ensembles, you know, the big bands or even a group like Pool and the Gang or where, you know, R&B bands where you have a five-piece horn section where you have two trumpets, you're able to really learn and grow, you know, from, from one another and inspire one another, which is always, you know, such a, such a great thing. And it, that's how you grow. It's always 
by inspiring each other and keeping the fire under each other that you're able to, you know, reach such a high, high level, um, you know, that I think you just don't get, you know, when you're, when you're by yourself. Oh, you I can agree with that. And the next to you, you like, okay, man, let's, let's go do this. Let's go light this up. And, you know, that was one of the really highlights for me being with Cool and the Gang is, you know, the night after night where Mike and I got to trade on Jungle Boogie and just, you know, inspire each other and have that conversation. And him doing one thing, I'm like, ooh, let me, let me see, let me pick up on that. And, you know, and really keep building and elevating the music and each, and each other, you know, which you just don't get any other way. You know, you really don't. Wow. Curtis. What's up? So why is the trumpet such a difficult instrument and why is it so sacred to you? Well, the thing with trumpet is, you know, the difficulty is like, like you know, we always talk about the chops and the endurance, you know, and to play high and accurate is just very, very challenging. You know, uh, Mike, and Ravi, you know, from what I've heard of Ravi and knowing Mike for as long as I have, you know, they are two of the best that I've ever seen, you know, and I just, you know, take my hat off and am humbled just to be with Mike and to, you know, I never got a chance to work with Ravi, although I wish I would have, but uh, like I said, I just try to, you know, do things to, you know, the long tones and, uh, you know, long tones help me the most as far as trying to keep the endurance and things up. Uh, it's this book uh, that I've been messing around with, uh, Carmine Caruso Calisthenics or something. Mm -hmm. I know you guys probably have heard of that before, you know, and that helps me. But, you know, like also what they said earlier, it's just such a majestic instrument. And like what Mike said, you know, who will call, who will come if the trumpet is weak, you know, so it has to be strong. Does the trumpet match the, the, the player's personality? Like with, with bass players, I find them to be very smooth cats. They kind of lead. you know, saxophone players have their, their attributes. What, what are some of the attributes of a trumpet player? Some of the similarities of all of you. Can I ask a question? Do we all, do any of us know a meek trumpet player? I think that uh, <laughs> no. not at all. Exactly. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> you, you can't be fearless, fearless and be <laughs> word as well. You gotta be fearless. Yeah. Yeah. You know, can I, let me say real briefly. You know, I, I feel as though trumpet player. It's like you always are walking on the edge of a sword or a razor. You know, our thing, because it is so loud and it is meant to lead and be out front that, you know, you do have to be on your toes. You really have to be on your P's and Q's because mm -hmm. unlike, let's say a bass player or, or some other instrument where if they miss a little something, then people may not catch it, but we are out there. You know, we are really walking on the tightrope. So if, if we miss, Everybody notices. Everybody. So to, Everybody. To be <laughs> and that and that's what creates a certain type type of personality. The person that has to, as Curtis said, has to be fearless. You have to be dynamic and say, uh uh, it's time to hit. I'm gonna go do this. And whatever happens, may it be, but I'm gonna I gotta come out and lay this down. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> totally agree. So what's the most difficult thing about playing the trumpet? Are you saying to me? Because I got a lot of that. <laughs> I could go on and on about how hard it is. <laughs> like professional athletes. You, that, that, that's right. That's right. You need to be in shape all the way. You know, um, the chops, the burning, the pain. Um, being the hardest instrument, I always say, to make a sound out of it. I always challenge, you know, sax players like, it's such a beautiful instrument, sax, and uh, you can play all day long. It's got a vibrating reed. It's almost like, in a way, cheating compared to playing the trumpet. I mean, trumpet, you got a vibration. You got the vibration right here. They got a reed. It's almost like a elongated harmonica, as long as you keep the reed just right. But me and, me and sax players, you know, in fact, 
my man was right about being an isolated trumpet player. The only time I learned something is when I saw another trumpet player from another band. You know, uh -huh. I'm, I'm playing with uh, a sax and, and a trombone. And, uh, you know, like, like you said, you stand out, you know, especially in those situations. There's no other trumpet player to sort of support you there. Not that I haven't played with other horns, but I mean, I'm talking about later on, you know, when we actually sign, you know, right. you know, so it's, it's, it's a hard instrument. I, I don't even advise playing. <laughs> I, 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 I learned the piano, man. Play guitar. I you know, you. <laughs> but, but I got to say, the competition is thinned out. You, you don't get as many trumpet players to compete as you would guitar players or piano players or, you know, bass players. You see them for miles, you know, but those are nice instruments to play. I mean, I kind of wish I played piano, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more question, and then we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsor. Who's your favorite trumpet player besides yourself? Here he is right here for me. Anybody recognize that guy? Brownie. That's it. <laughs> Clifford Brown. Oh, good Lord. Ridiculous. You know. Yeah. Plus, anybody can scream. You guys out there, I know you guys can scream. I only screamed one time in my life. You know, one, I was at a, I was at this club and I was uh, just sitting in, and uh, I was trying to learn jazz and I'm playing off from the top of my head. They love what I was playing, but I'm trying to learn those riffs, you know. And uh, I got so tired, I ran out of chops, and they kept playing. And, and I some somehow I just started screaming, hitting these high notes and blasting the place. I had to lift the horn up in order to, you know, not hurt anybody out there. And, Right. It was an amazing experience, but just because I was in a band with like, like three, I think it was three other trumpets, uh, bass, baritone, sax, a guy called Doc in uh, Virginia, a club there in Virginia. You guys may know Doc. I don't know. Old guy, big baritone sax, bad. I got to say, as a side note, I'm jealous because all of these other trumpet players dance their behind off. I'm the most non dancing individual out of the whole list here today. <laughs> Curtis, who's your favorite trumpet player? I love Clifford Brown, but I got to go with Lee Morgan. That's my Lee man right there. Yeah, All say. day long, Lee Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because I just love his tone. I love his phrasing. I love his feeling. You know, I just, you know, he's just my all time favorite, man. The more I listen to him. Now, like I said, if I listen to a couple Clifford Brown songs, I kind of get on the edge, but then when I go back to Lee, it's, it's Lee all day, you know, <laughs> all day. All right. In the scripture, the creator starts with the trumpet. What do you yes. think that? Why? Well, because the sound of the horn resonates for a long distance, and it um, also penetrates the soul without amplification. And um, when it's played right and correctly, uh, the sound of it, it uh, can touch the back of your stomach, your spine, your inner soul. And so for those of us that would do a, I've seen guys, I did something with the Whispers one time, and they were doing this gospel CD. And they had a sax player on there. I said, now how are you going to have a sax player on the gospel CD when the trumpet, Gabriel played the trumpet, not the saxophone? <laughs> and they started cracking up. And that's how I actually got my gig playing for them on their gospel CD. So I had to use that logic. I'm like, man, it wasn't no saxophone. It was a trumpet. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> I hear you. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It, it is at the top of the blue chain in regards to a horn section, in my opinion. It, uh. You know, it, 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 it is an unforgiving instrument. When it's right, it's all right. And when it's wrong, it's all wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, I, I love playing trumpet within the section because it's kind of like the center of the sound of what a section is going to be, whether or not it's a big band or a funk band with three or four horns or an orchestral situation with strings. You know, trumpet brings the excitement more times than not. Mm -hmm. Why is the trumpet such a difficult instrument to play? 
Well, it's hard on the lips, that's for sure. <laughs> and it takes a whole lot of air, you know, it takes a whole lot of air, but I've been doing it for a long time, so I've gotten used to it over the years. Yeah, of course, like with everyone, I was most inspired initially by Clifford Brown, and I love Clifford and Lee. My father has a, has a, Jew, a huge jazz collection, so I grew up listening to Clifford and Lee more than anyone. And then, of course, Miles and Freddie, you know, and KD uh, and Woody Shaw, I, I say in there, you know. And then when I was younger, too, I mean, Winton, Winton was coming around and I was really checking out, man, listen to what this cat is doing in terms of his technical approach. So I was really influenced by him as well. But, um, you know, Clifford, Lee, and Freddie are the trifecta. That's my holy trinity, uh-huh. right? Here, that yeah. I. Well, Lali, it's nice to have some people above ground. There's a lot of dead people. Former, you know, that have left such a mark. So one that's alive now that I like is Arturo Sandoval. Oh, oh yes, yes, yeah. no doubt. With us when we were in Austria. No, Australia. No, Austria. We were right. We're in Perth, and uh, the things he played on Summer Madness. I mean, screaming solo. You would never expect it on that song. And I got a lot of uh, respect for him. Of course, um, I think we all have learned Clifford Brown and Freddie and Lee Morgan and Miles and, you know, the Giants, you know. But then Arturo Spanking. You know, say other James Anderson, what's that boy's name? He plays trombone too. Hmm. James Morrison. Morrison. Yeah. Well, who's your favorite? Well, uh, well I, I'm lucky because I got a chance to hear everybody else's choices, but um, I have to agree with everybody as far as influence. But I think um, I started listening to a lot more to guys that I could sort of emulate early on. And, you know, we're all stealing licks from each other. But uh, what really got my ear going, Blue Mitchell, like solos like that, where I could just sing them in my head and then and try to play them and try to get that sound like uh you know clifford brown the same, all that kind of stuff but um like michael said the, the guys that are living today that they can do it all you know they can play the lead book um and they can just solo like crazy you know sandoval like you said uh james morrison um those guys are just great a lot of influence for me nice, nice. amen thank you so much and on that note Let's hear a word from our sponsor, Le Coup Champagne. During this time of unprecedented chaos, confusion, and misinformation, we do have one thing in common, each other. United we stand, divided we fall. So just be cool, and let's beat this coronavirus together with love and understanding. Stay focused, stay calm, stay home. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Celebrate life, and this too shall come to pass. Have a glass of a cool champagne. Thank you from our sponsor, the Cool Champagne. Make sure you go out and get that. So we're here, we're having a fireside chat with the trumpeters. It's an amazing show, Tales from the Stage. We're telling tales from the stage. And right now I'd like to ask the gentleman about tour life. What, what was it like? What is it like? What did you not like? I wanna hear some secrets. Talk to me. Tour, one word, women. <laughs> the women were unbelievable. Gorgeous, seems like the most gorgeous women would come backstage. I don't mm-hmm. know if they were competing or whatever, but these, these girls are beautiful. I'm telling you, drop dead beautiful. 
And uh, that was the most memorable thing about tour. You know, of course, it was a party, a, a, an entire party. And the tour bus was great, too. Sleeping great. in the bus, better than sleeping in the hotels. They should make a tour bus bed, you know, with the vibration of the, of the bus as it's going down the road, you know, put you dead to sleep. But uh, all I can say is the women were fantastic. And the trumpet players, well, I was the only one, but uh, I know Sharon Bryan told me uh, uh, when the other guys come down with their women, they're, they're, they're happy and everything. But when, you're, when you come out with your women, they're in love. So what do you do? And I said, well, Sharon, I'm the trumpet player. <laughs> so I guess I got a little advantage there, you know. But uh, I'll pass that on to you guys before I get a little too deep. <laughs> no, we would. Uh, I did three years with the stylistics, and we had an old uh, bread truck that we put all the equipment in and drive. Back then, when James Brown had the big black bus, you know. And then he played shows with a around, you know. You ever seen him find somebody, like he's waving to somebody? That's fifty dollars. Mm. Get into that, you know. And the time away from family, that can tell it's tale. You know, it's uh we've done like six, seven months straight. So uh you get used to it. You know, this is the longest with this coronavirus thing that I've been in one place for the past 10, 15 years. I've been, I've been home. So it's like I said, I'm going downstairs. I see you later. I'm on the road. <laughs> Skip Martin, what what was it like? What is it like? This thing that we clamor for when we see you it has to be a facade some of it tell me about well, it some of it maybe but there's a lot of real stuff that is that happens out there that a lot of people uh they would think that it's a story but mm -hmm. um we've made a lot of stories about these different things that have gone on with us uh, out there in the world and um um so some of the stories there's one of the stories that i have about, with michael ray and um, he'll laugh, he'll start laughing about that. I, I call him my B-flat brother and we go, Sabbath, who the heck? Because uh, James Brown, that's how he used to talk to his band. And uh, so Mike and I, we were, like the, we were like the black sheep. We were like the ones who were a little bit different. We'd go out and do little stuff and what have you. And um, we went to Holland one time. We were playing in Amsterdam. And... Um, so we were on this tour going through Europe. And we were going to different countries, Oslo, Norway, and this one and that one, and Denmark and Copenhagen. And we finally got to Holland. And, and so first thing we wanted to do was when we got there, we decided we were going to go to one of the coffee shops and get us some of that hash that they had from the coffee shop that they were selling. Oh, Lord. We were like, we couldn't even believe it. We were like, OK, <laughs> let's go to this place. So me and Mike, we go in there, and, you know, we walked down, we walked and watched the red light district and all that stuff and found us a coffee shop. We went in that coffee shop and we got this square about, oh, about yay big, yay mm -hmm. wide and about this thin, right? It was black, it was called bubblegum hash. So we got that stuff and we had, you know, we smoked a little bit of it, what have you, but we got so messed up. We were like, nah, we're getting ready to go into Paris the next day. So what are we gonna do with this? We got to play Hammersmith Odeon or something like that in Paris. And, um, you know, we can't, we can't go to the borders because the custom officer is going to bust us and we're going to be in trouble. So Mike looked at me. I looked at Mike. And we bent that thing up. And he swallowed half and I swallowed half. And that was about 7.30 in the morning when we were on the, way, on the bus on the way to Paris. So we go all day. We get to, the, get to Hammersmith Odeon. We're getting ready to do this sound check and everything. We do the sound check about four o'clock. It's been so long, we forgot that we even did that. Mm -hmm. Now here it comes about seven o'clock in the evening. The show starts at eight. And I'm sitting over there in the dressing room. 
and all of a sudden it just came down. <laughs> I was so effed up. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my God, I'm panicking because I'm singing like, I'm singing two hours of a two and a half hour show. And I got to remember all these lyrics and I'm having a panic attack because I can't remember not one damn word. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, I've never been high on the stage. Oh shit, what am I going to do? And I turn around and I look at Mike. And both me and Mike had red eyes together like this. We looked at each other. We said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> All glamorous, right? People can say, oh, it must be so wonderful, so glamorous what you do. And, you know, of course, there are aspects of it that it is. I mean, you know, you get to travel all over the world and play music for people um, on someone's dime. Someone's, you know, taking care of your flight, your travel accommodations and your hotel accommodations. And who doesn't love that? But as, as Mike said, you know, right, you're away from your family a significant part of time. Um, people don't realize, oh, well, when I have a gig and maybe I don't get back to the hotel room until midnight and then I have to be back in the lobby at 3.30 in the morning to, you know, get on to head to the airport to get an early morning 5 a.m. flight. But, and then as soon as I, you know, take a flight for a couple hours, I may have to go straight to the venue to do the next gig. They don't understand always the inner workings of, of what that can be like. And even though you may be tired, you, the show has to happen. You know, you still, you're there to make people happy and bring them some music. So, you know, you have to dig deep t sometimes to really, uh, to, to really bring that. Um, but, you know, that's what being on the road is about. You know, that's what we've all spent countless hours in a practice room for many, many, many years so that we can have that opportunity and get a taste of that. You know, for 30 years, uh, the first 15 years, I was a, a player. And then the last 13, 14 years, I was the conductor of the band. But I toured all over the world and we spent a lot of time away from home, uh, a lot of time on the ship. Uh, when I was stationed in Japan, you know, visited 20 different countries and I was stationed in Italy um, well before 9-11. So we did quite a bit of travel. But, yeah, there's a lot of time away from home. Uh, I was lucky enough to do it uh, with a uniform on and supporting our country and, you know, kind of showing what Americans look like overseas because that's uh, the Navy band. That was the only folks that they saw, uh, Americans. So um, that was a great opportunity, but it was it was tough go in the in the beginning. Uh, and then playing with fish, uh, that that was some great times, but very long days, uh, very long nights, and learning music on the road, uh, just trying to make a different show every night. But uh, some great experiences. But uh, I think being away from the family uh, was the toughest. You know, just my time in the military, we've had. Um, uh, all three three of our kids were born on a different continent, so uh, we really lived that kind of life. But uh, it's nice to be back, kind of rooted here in New England, and I'm playing with a, uh, a blues band right now that's doing real well. The album just came out the day that COVID hit, so mm -hmm. we're kind of laying back. But uh, um, the band's called Room Full of Blues, and we're doing really good on the charts. But hopefully, can't wait to get back out there and uh, start digging again. My career started with the stylistics when I was 15 years old. And within um, a three or four year period between say 15 and 19, I started out with the stylistics and went from the stylistics to Carl Bumble and the Blue Notes for several years, Ray Goodman and Brown. You know, we call it the singing doo-wop chilling circuit, you know, where I basically played with everybody, Ray Goodman and Brown, the Dells, Delphonics, OJs, yada, yada, yada. And a lot of times, uh, you know, the stylistics of Harold Mubbin and the Blue Notes were touring situations where I, permanent, where I was a permanent member of their band for long term. And then uh, situations like the uh, OJs and Delphonics, it was more so we got called to play the gig, had a quick sound check rehearsal, went over the charts, and played the concert. Uh, you know, but one of the highlights of my life is within a two-year period, I got the contract to be the horn section leader for probably three of the most dynamic uh, vocalists of all time.
that would be Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight, and Aretha Franklin. And I did all of them within a year and a half, two year period, uh, where I contracted large horn sections for all of them. Uh, the Patti LaBelle situation was a 30 piece orchestra. The uh, Aretha Franklin situation was 10 horns. And the, and the Gladys situation was actually 15 horns. You know, so. <laughs> uh, man, th th that was a, a heck of a situation. We never saw any of those artists until we literally got on stage. They didn't make sound check. They didn't make rehearsal. None of that. We just rehearsed the music and hit it and quit it. Good times. Oh, that's that's good time. amazing. That's amazing. What I also know about you, Henry, is that your band, you, you're in a unique position because your band, you, especially on those Soul Train cruises and things, you play for everybody. Oh, you this is true. Your, you know, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we're going into our fifth year uh, this January, but actually based on the pandemic, because of the pandemic, it's been delayed, um, postponed another year. But um, UGO, my show band, uh, which stands for the Urban Guerrilla Orchestra, we're the house band on the ship. So we do the Soul Train Cruise in January, and we do the Ultimate Disco Cruise in February. And it's a unique situation for me because I get to have 12 musicians that, you know, are on stage at the same time, backing up everybody. I mean, we've done the Daz Band, Melissa Morgan, um, Tavares, Stylistics, Gerald Austin and the Manhattans, the Spinners. Uh, you know, and we learn all of their music, have a couple rehearsals and, and hit it. Two shows a piece on the cruise ship. And we've done that the last four January, starting in 2017. And it's absolutely been fabulous. I mean, we did Karen White. I mean, geez, this is endless. Probably seven to eight artists each year for the last four years going into the fifth year. And the girls, uh, especially, <laughs> love the girls. But uh, it's pretty much, you know, they pay us to travel because you know the shows you know I almost would pay them to do it but <laughs> those show the travel man you know like you say you know where you come off a plane in certain situations go straight to a sound check uh you got an hour to be back for the show then you got a 2 a.m lobby call that stuff is brutal man you know but uh i wouldn't be doing anything else other than this, and I can't wait to get back out touring again. You know, I my passport is dusty right now. I want to blow the dust off and jump on a plane right now. Uh, but you know, yeah, like um, you don't see uh, the you know how rough it can be. You know, everybody sees us when we're on stage and the lights are on and people are hollering and screaming. But I mean, when you're pulling up to that airport. I remember being with the gang. I think we pulled up to the airport in Istanbul somewhere. It's like 6 a.m. The airport isn't even open, you know? We gotta wait for them to open the airport to get in there. And that stuff is just rough. And, uh, but again, love every minute of it, you know, even though sometimes when you're doing it, it is just like, what the hell am I doing here? Oh, can I say hell? <laughs> but anyway, I can't wait to get back on the road. Absolutely. I got to say one thing. Can I say one yes, thing? Absolutely. After, say what you must. After listening to you guys, man, I want to go give my tour manager a medal. Because <laughs> that guy had it going on. It was, it was almost like it was really nice. Vacation in a vacation. We had plenty of time, at least three days per venue. You know, um, which gives gave you a lot of time to have some fun, and um, man, w sometimes we use the plane now and then. But it was that tour bus that I like so much. And, uh, 
you guys, man, it was that's that's pretty heavy schedule in there, you know. I don't know if I could have endured that. <laughs> it so was rough. Tour, that tour manager was sweet. I got to find that guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell him how much I appreciate his scheduling. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Michael Ray, scheduling. Yeah. Let's talk about the the most ideal schedule versus a schedule that's just almost impossible for an artist to keep up with. Mm. Well, at first, the easiest tour we that I've had, we went on the Van Halen tour. You worked 50 minutes for the show, three shows a week, everything you need backstage, catering, vitamins, massage, you know, so it takes the stress out. That was sweet. And now you're talking. Very sweet. There was something in Bosnia or somewhere in the winter, you know, it gets quite precarious. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like they say, if you finish leave the stage, you don't have that much time to enjoy whatever. Get some food, get some sleep, and you're gone. And after a while, you don't when you start waking up, you don't know what city you're in. It, it can be uh, detrimental to trying to keep up with a schedule, you know. But uh, it's what we do. Right, right, right. Bill, I want to come back to you for a second. Expand on, um, you, you were with Atlantic Star, and, and they were a tremendous thing. I'd like you to expand on some of the negativity that you experienced well you know what the first negative thing was um my first wife left me for playing with the band mm. <laughs> but that turned out to be a blessing <laughs> on the road <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to worry about family you know my family was the band and we loved each other but there were some bad apples or so bad seeds that were actually i remember i don't want to say his name but the guitar player as we're walking off stage he actually said the trumpet section the horn section he said the horn section was distracting the crowd from the lead singers i'll mm -hmm. never forget that statement that, i didn't even impress him you know because we were distracting the crowd from the lead singer but you know if you're moving with your guitar and doing your thing right, you know, hey, in, in those days, I guess he thought everything should be on the lead singer, like just a single spotlight or something, you know. But me and Koran, we had made up some moves to that song, uh, uh, Stand Up, not like those moves you see online now. It's one little taping that's key, you can't find. We made up moves, man, that were off the hook. I've never seen them before. Um, I developed a lot of those moves in drum and bugle corps because I played with the state lines of Byron, Byron Connecticut. And, uh, and I was one of the featured guys with moving the horn. But in those days, we were just, just whirling the thing around your wrist so much it looked like a star in your hand. And you're moving it all over the place as you're whirling. But with, the, with Atlantic Star, it was more like having a nunchuck. You know, and we're both making these moves that people just had to look at along with the steps. In fact, the choreographer actually thanked me for the, for the added moves that I put in there. Um, but don't compare it to the ones you see online where I'm going around and, oh, God, it's so corny, I tell you. And the horn, the, the horn, actually the horn uh, type is very, very, uh, the uh, the writer of, of the horn lines, uh, uh, the piano player, it was the corniest horn lines I've ever heard in my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I should have stepped in there, you know, but nobody wanted to rock the boat. And I was still uh, 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 struggling with that R band's technique of playing the horn, not the modern, but the old technique. And uh, you can play well if you're blasted, but if you're by a mic, then you have to try to control your, 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 your volume. And that can throw you off a lot, in and out, out and in, you know, the way you are, you're changing mouthpieces, moving everything else until I ran into Ray Brown. He gave me a real scoop. But um, also, you know, it was like, it was a wonderful band and nobody quit Atlantic Star. Mm. We were stabbing back, backstabbing, you know, 
uh, and uh, the uh, the company didn't know any better. But after one album with them, it was the best uh, uh, sales that we had, um, other than our first album, which. Uh, well, there's rumors that they didn't want to give the money to this manager because they didn't trust them, and so they didn't give us the, the, the gold or platinum, whatever it was that, that we, we got on that first album. But anyway, um, you know, so there's all kinds of things that come up years afterwards if you find out find that it happened. But uh, the manager and the accountant were doing something nefarious. We weren't making any money. We were making uh, same money you would make if you were working at, you know, uh, Burger King. Uh, Basically, wow. a stipend. You know, and this was supposed to be building the shop and all that. So we were being conned at the same time. And then the uh, a, a family. There was a family, there were three brothers in the band, and uh, the older brother got involved because the company didn't want to give any money to the manager unless one person from the band. So he picked the one person that, you know, basically uh, shined his boots every morning with a dunk. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first here, the tales from the stage. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Kurt, in any, any negativity in your, in your career that you'd like to tell us about? Not that I want to talk about. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, but you know, it, music is, is the same old story, you know. Uh, the people, you know, at the top that's uh, talking to the right people are the ones getting paid. And um, everyone else is trying to hold on, trying to get their slice of the pie. You know, uh, if you're, as, as the brother said, if you're licking the right person's boots, you know, more often than not, you will be the one that gets, you know, a good size share of the pie. If you're not, uh, you have to, you know, deal with it and try to make the most out of it. Um, I just, um, you know, music is just what I do is what I've always been put here to do. Uh, I always make the best out of whatever the situation is. And uh, that's how I continue to uh to roll you know okay all right carl you coming from the rock side of things and the navy side of things any negativity you like to share with us got a tale you want to tell um you know not not too bad i guess just the uh the long days and the long nights and being away from home but nothing really bad nothing too negative not even in fish um I, no, not real well. Just some, just some long bus rides and uh, and some long days and some long nights. But just getting out on stage made it all worth it. You just kind of forget it for those ninety minutes. You know, just it brings back everything, uh, you know, back to center. And uh, but I mean, now looking back, I just look back with rose-colored glasses, right? At the time, it was probably a real pain. Um, but you know, I look back and say it was such a great experience. So. I really don't have too many complaints at all. I'm very, very lucky, uh, super lucky to have had the opportunity. So Absolutely. that's the way to look back at it. Ravi, I know you have a tale to tell. <laughs> so, you know, when you're developing in your, your career, I think we've all had stories where we've dealt with maybe band leaders that um, were difficult or, you know, staying in a hotel that was not the greatest, you know, at the time. Um, but, you know, that, that's, what, that's what developing your career and paying your dues is all about. You know, I, I've been in hotels where it was raining and the water was dripping down on my bed or, you know, the hotel, uh, somebody found bed bugs. And so I slept in a chair with my jacket and everything all tightened. Because I was so worried about, you know, worried about that, you know, and that's what paying dues is when, when you're young. But, you know, this is a business. And so once you establish yourself at a certain place, you're able to say, well, you know, these are the conditions. I, this is uh, what I need for myself financially if I want to be on a part of this. And, you know, I can ask, you know, well, what are the travel accommodate? What are the accommodations like? What's the travel like? 
you know, um, and then, you know, be able to make the decisions whether I, or not I, this would be the right thing for me, if it's worth it for me or, or not. Um, but, you know, we, we've all paid dues. You know, that's part of what the music industry is about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the greats have always told me, you, you're going to pay your dues, son. It's part of the business. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. So at this point on, on Tales from the Stage, we love to, to mix it up with you seasoned cats. But we also want to keep in mind that there are young players coming up after you. So we have a segment entitled Here and Now. It's a spotlight. And this edition, we will feature a trumpet player. She's vicious. I love her. Her name is Arnetta Johnson. She's with Beyonce and so many, many others out there. And she also happens to be my MD for my band, La Funkalicious, which is female horn players. So, you know. Um, so, at this point, I'd like to just have you take a look at that video. And so that is Arnetta Johnson. If you don't know her, you will. Beyonce loves her and we love her as well. So gentlemen, we are back. We are telling tales from the stage. It's a fireside chat with the trumpeters. I'm enjoying it. I hope that you are as well. So we're, we're, we're dealing with coronavirus and riots and we just had Juneteenth and we have someone in the White House who uh, is interesting I'll say. <laughs> is when that what you say? <laughs> That's what I'll say. Okay. <laughs> I could say more. You sure I'll host, I'll host the show correctly. Thank you sponsors. Where do we go from here? What, nobody, there are no, A, AEG has no shows. You know, nobody's doing any shows. They're talking about 2021. What do you think is going to happen? Well, there's talk about uh, AEG that, I think Garth Brooks signed up for 300 shows at the drive, drive in. That's the mm -hmm. new concept that they're flying. I mean, cool management said, uh, manager Cecil Williamham, who's he's been in business a long time, said, "All I need is 400 cars to get the thing started." You know, yeah. so that's <laughs> you know. And then the, the Zoom thing, you just you just get past this latency problem. You know, everybody's playing. You know, personally, I think where we go from here, I'm in the studio. They just do us new stuff. It's like, you know, it keeps you fresh. You know, because not playing is like a, a death sentence. If I'm not on, if I don't play my horn with for three days, I get yeah. chops, chop lips, and you know, yeah. the muscles <laughs> And then, uh, you know, on the sidebar, when COVID hit, I took time out to get double knee replacement. And, uh, just when I got back on my horn, I was so weak. My stomach felt and said, wow, my chops are not bad, but my stomach was weak. The whole thing about just trying to regenerate the muscles, you know, 
And even like, like I say, there's eight minutes and 46 seconds I stood for George Floyd. I was struggling with that. So it's getting better, but it's so slow, you know, because I knew when I was having this operation, I wanted to be able to, I can't wait to run, and I can just give somebody a, a kick with my knee and stuff, and oh, we don't recommend that. So there you have it. Thank you, Michael. You know, this pandemic situation affects everybody differently. I mean, there's musicians that tour all the time, like Mike and Curtis and Skip. As a matter of fact, most of the artists that are on this are guys that tour with specific groups where they play big arenas. My situation is a little unique where the things that I do the majority of the time with UGO are, are more from a private parameter where it's, you know, three, four, five hundred 500 people in the ballroom. And uh, I've been completely shut down since the 14th of March mm -hmm. um, in every way, shape, form, or fashion. And basically, it was crazy. Um, I had work on the 21st and the 28th. Mm -hmm. April got wiped out. May got wiped out. And then in the middle of May, June, July, and August got wiped out. All booked and contracted dates, weddings, corporate events, outdoor events, and uh, for the Department of Recreation in various counties in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware area. And basically, right now, I'm looking at September the 12th. I'm really not expecting anything to happen for the rest of the year, truthfully. And the Soul Train and Disco Cruises have both been postponed right. for a year. Right, for a year. So right. literally, right. I don't know when my next gig is going to be. And at this point, I'm not even willing to guess because I have gigs that were seven, eight, nine months out that yes. completely disappeared from my calendar. Right. You know, so I, um, you know, I'm thankful for the blessings of still being able to keep the lights on and a, and a wonderful wife, you know, mm -hmm. that supports me immensely. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been rough for a lot of us. You know, we, we're spending a lot of time checking on each other on the telephone because we all have our moments of weakness, man. Yeah. This thing, this thing has been rough. It's like every week, you think that you got a hold on it, and 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 the rug gets pulled out from you again. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, eventually everything's got to come back, mm -hmm. but it's definitely going to be different. That's for sure. It'll absolutely be different. You know? Carl. Oh, it's it's been tough. I mean, just not playing with the band is has been really difficult for me. And I think over the years. Um, I've been lucky just if you have enough work and you have enough gigs and you're playing a lot, but I just never was one to sit in a practice room for too long, but you get lonely and that's what you, you go back to. And uh, it's just been really tough. And uh, so I'm hoping just like Michael said, um, things start happening for us and uh, for everybody out there, uh, you know, cause they're, they're allowing people to, getting these groups and and they're not paying attention but i think with um if they get out there and find something that's going to fix this um we'll get out there and start doing what we do best it's just uh it's just a, it's a difficult time thank you so much carl what do you think needs to happen skip well different Difficulties always present themselves, but there's always an answer to that difficulty and a solution. So part of the solution is doing what we're doing right now, because had we not had this COVID virus and all of this, we wouldn't have <clears throat> been creative enough to create something like what we're doing right now to share this with people. And if you get people to join and, and volunteer and join it, you can even get people to pay money to watch and join and be a part of a special presentation. This is something that has evolved due to hardship. So growth never comes in a comfort zone. So this is what we are dealing with. We're dealing with uncomfortable circumstances, but what is emerging is the growth of character. You know, um, the music is always gonna go on, you know, and uh, I'm sure that it will continue to do so. Thank you so much. 
uh, Ravi, where are you? What do you think? Where do we go from here? You know, I, I'll say that um, I am a firm believer in science, you know, and I, I do believe that at a certain point, uh, science is what's going to save us. You know, I, I, I see people being, you know, very creative, like Mike was saying. I've heard several people talk about drive-ins becoming a new possibility. Um, but, you know, the sad thing for me, and it, it's somewhat what Curtis is saying as well, you know, music is a very intimate thing. You know, it's the intimacy, it's the closeness, it, you know, because we're communicating and not only within the musicians on the bandstand, but within the audience. And so, you know, we need to be able to be close to the people that we're communicating and having that union with, you know, I mean, I can't see not being in the vanguard or not being at the blue note or, you know, clubs that are small and intimate that the history of our, our music has come out of that. Um, and, and even larger theaters. I mean, playing in a theater that is, let's say, a 500 to a 1,000 seat house. I mean, you know, the energy of having that many people in a room in an, in an arena, you know, yelling for you and, and, and having that interaction, um, there's no way to replace that, really. You know, so I'm hopeful. I think science will, you know, will will win eventually. I mean, you know, there have been other viruses and other diseases and things that have existed, and science has prevailed. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to be quick fixed, as we know. So it's forcing us to be creative. But I think um, over time, you know, I believe in science, and science will prevail, and we will be back. I, I'm inspired. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Oh my goodness. Hey Robbie, that was really that was really well put, man. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. I mean, I feel like I should hum a, a tune or something. Yeah. Bill. Yeah. I have to follow that. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> hey, guys, you I'm, tell you, here, I'm gonna tell you guys, I need some tips. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real. Ever since I lost that tooth, it's been funny. I mean, you know, but I, for one, I'm used to being inside. So COVID was no change for me, man. I mean, I'm uh, I'm inside. I'm a gamer. You know, I, I teach chess, you know, online, and you know, uh, I've got the PlayStation and you know my own, my own computer. I built, you know, from way back in the day. But it's 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 keeping up. Just put a four hundred dollar video card in bad boy to keep up with some of the latest uh, 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 games. But also, my horn's sitting here. My horn's sitting in buckets because I'm in a senior citizen's, uh, 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 you know, complex. And I'm, I might be the oldest here. I'm 70. Mm -hmm. so, you you know, look amazing. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the horn, I have to keep a mute in it. In fact, it's called the, uh, you guys may, may know this mute. Oh, Island Brass. I definitely have one. <laughs> Got to have it. Got that. And in order for me to really feel the horn, I need to get in the car, drive off down the road here in Yanceville, North Carolina, someplace off of the side of the road, and play in my car, open horn, which is a whole different experience. As a, a, you can do a lot of things with that Island Brass, believe it or not, because of the pressure, you can you can really create some very very creative uh, lines. But it uh, it's a muted horn. You know, seriously muted. But uh, uh, open horn, that experience is something else. And uh, I was just wondering, guy told me that doing this <laughs> will actually help you uh, play a higher register. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Michael? Is that I how think you guys it depends do? on the person. I hear people that I mean, if you're, stand if you're by that. Horn, it's a form of buzzing, you know. Exactly. So, but, but, that's but, always when you, but when you try to do it in the horn, it doesn't come through like just normal buzzing in the horn. For me, I, well, there was a cat, uh, Jerome Calais, who mm -hmm. he recently passed. This cat would play without a mouthpiece. And just put I'm just saying Arturo do that, man. Yeah. A whole yeah. song without a mouthpiece. So just developing the embouchure up here, 
you know, like he used to teach me, like, you got to have your top lip and turn it down. Mm -hmm. get more because the sea cup was kind of spread, spread your lips thin. Yeah. So if you're biting down, you know. And that and did I know I listened to Rafael Mendez playing uh, Paganini. So the double tonguing helped me improve. Like yeah. my son was a classical player. And he said, Dad, why don't you try to get this? So I've been practicing with it. For so long, I still haven't got past page one. <laughs> but uh, he said, uh, "Well, you know, you'll improve your sound. You know, I started to feel good about it." He said, "Well, Dad, you just didn't know how bad you sound." <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, "Thank you." Oh, <laughs> oh, he meant good. Robbie, he meant good bad. <laughs> Yes. Ravi, you got a tip for us since we're giving out some tips as we, before we wrap it up. You got yeah. a trumpet tip. Uh, wow. I mean, if we're talking about range and, and, and that type of thing, um, you know, I'm a strong proponent of dealing with your tongue arching, you know, because we're talking about speed of air, not volume of air. And the thing about pinching down, you know, you don't want to close off your apertures as well. I mean, you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, I, I grew up uh, doing the Claude Gordon method, um, which I found very, very helpful uh, in terms of dealing with, you know, my range. And because Claude's book really deals with a lot of your, you know, arching your tongue levels and, and working with that to get the speed and rate of air. Um, for the extreme register, because um, it's really not a lot of air that we need. It's just a faster speed. So, um, you know, I guess I'll just throw Claude Gordon's name into the pot. Nice. All right. So you you did a lot of ah yahs, huh? Ah yah 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 yah. Ah yah 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 yah. Nice. Yeah. What? Um, tips do you have to share regarding playing the trumpet? Not not so much the life path, but some actual physical um, tips that you can share about how you approach your trumpet and, and something that might be helpful for other um, trumpet players. The one thing that I would say is just be true to the instrument. Um, Practice makes perfect. The more that you're on it, the better off you're going to be. The, the, the more that you play the trumpet, it becomes a part of you. You and, the, you and the horn become one, and you know how to automatically go to certain postures and positions and, um, you know, little techniques that will enable you to be able to execute things on the horn by being familiar and playing things over and over again, you know. I have always come from the premise, as boring as it may be, the ability to be able to play it as slow as you possibly can and to speed the passage up as fast as you can. But in order for you to play it fast, you always have to play it slow mm -hmm. for each note to be measured and, and to be meticulously played. Mm -hmm. Okay. On that note, thank you, Henry McMillan. Any last tips you have for us before we wrap this up? Got any trumpet tips? Sing it from your heart because all those licks and all of those scales don't mean nothing if you're not saying something. It's just like trying to talk to a beautiful woman and you just start babbling. I want to tell you this, I love you, and you go great, and all this, and this. She starts blocking you out after a while. So what you do say, say something, and then let the space speak in between it so that people will listen and be prepared for the next thing that you're going to say. I like to thank the, the host, even though she's my wife, but she, she's been doing a lot of work on this, trying to pull it together. And this is just one episode of what she's got mixed down. So I say stay in tune, stay aware. 
Thank you. Great job, that, sis. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all of you so much. And as we are closing the show, I'd like to first of all say thank you to our sponsors, The Big Easy of Trenton. Please make sure you support them. Look, at, look them up on stage. And the cool champagne. Oh, it's delicious. Mm. The, the beverage of the stars. Thank you to my sponsors. Thank you to everyone. The team that, that we put together for Tales from the Stage. Folks have been working behind the scenes. I wake people up early in the morning and we go to sleep late at night. So thank you so much. Um, you'll see them in the credits. To, to the celebrities, we have enjoyed you, all of you, for many years. Your music, your style, everything about you. Thank you for giving us legacy that we can pass on to our children. Uh, uh.